everyone. Welcome back to A Life of KG. I am super excited about this episode because I have Lauren on the show all the way from Australia and she is a seven figure business owner in the Lash world. And I literally feel like she is a long lost sister from the other side of the world. We could talk for absolutely hours and we talk about everything from how she built a seven figure business to how she recommends and scaling a business to teams, literally everything pricing we also talk about. So without further ado, here she is. Welcome to the life of KG. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I feel really um honored to be on here thanks so thank you so much oh no it's so nice to have you on and you're all the way from Australia I think you're our first Australian guest oh wow wow yes well I am all the way from Australia country Australia I'm not in the city (laughs) I love it one of my favorite places (laughs) Australia yeah yeah one of my favorite And and they say that um Australia is like just a hot version of the UK have you been to the UK a hot no and I'm dying to visit I you know I think Australia yeah it's it's it we're very very similar I think similar personalities and you know similar sense of humor and things like that so um you just have a lot more history and like really old buildings and statues and stuff that I really want to see I really really want to see it oh you'll have to come you'll have to come yes (laughs) So, Lauren, introduce yourself and just let our listeners know exactly what you do. Uh, So, my name is Lauren Lappin. Uh, I have a lash and brow salon in Albury, New South Wales, Australia. Um, It's pretty, it's not a small town, but it's not a big city. Um, I've had that for almost nine years. I started my own product line in 2018, so four years ago, uh, Runway Lash Co. I did do training for a little while, but I realized that I didn't really like training people in in how to do lashes, so I gave that up. Um, I was much more focused on, and not just focused, but just wanting to see, um, you know, women succeed in business and I and I I could see that a lot of people in our industry really um you know had no experience no idea about um running operating and growing managing teams things like that so um yeah I decided okay like after I think in about 2019 I thought I want to be a coach in this industry and uh I was too scared I was too scared to put myself out there and say that I could give advice or, or whatever, but, um, yeah, so I, I've deliberated like for two years all through 2019, 2020, um, it was really only in 2021 that I started, um, putting it out there, you know, just bits and pieces of content about running, running a business and things like that. So yeah, I'm, I'm a business coach and mentor like yourself. Um, and I just recently sold my wholesale company, um, just in November. So, that's really exciting. Uh, I was just feeling like it didn't really light me up anymore, just running an online store and, you know, shipping out products, even though I really didn't have a lot to do in that business anymore because I just delegated everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm excited now to put more of a focus on my coaching and mentoring and also on my salon and team. Um, so right now at this very point in time, Alua Lash and Beauty Bar is, is my lash and brow salon and, and yeah, and just me as as a coach and mentor, content creator, podcaster. <laughs> we are so similar in what we do. It's we actually are. hilarious. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I feel like I found a sister across the world. <laughs> I know, I know. This is crazy. <laughs> do you find then, I guess it's quite similar to in the UK, is in our industry, people start businesses because they're good at what they do as in the service yes. but then yes. actually have no idea how to run the business and that's yeah. where you come yep. in right yeah every time um I I haven't come across many people um I do know of a couple of Australian entrepreneurs like um one springs to mind um she owns a chain of uh hair extension specific 
else, you know, specialized salons, hair salons. Mm. And, um, yeah, she's not a hairdresser. She just really liked getting hair extensions and knew all about them and found out where to source them and how to apply them and yeah, has built a whole empire around hair extensions. Mm. Um, but those stories are few and far between. Um, it really tends to be, like you said, um, yep. Either hairstylists, um, cosmetic tattooist, nail artist, lash artist, brow artist, uh, beauty therapist, tanning, um, um, girls that do spray tanning, you know, um, do we call them tanning artists? I don't know. Um, spray <laughs> girls that do spray, <laughs> spray tanners, um, but girls that specialize in what they do, they're very, very good at it. And of course it's, it's kind of natural to just go, okay, well, I'm going to start, um, a business out of this. And like, that's fine if you're that way inclined, but there are a lot of people out there too, that are very, very good at their job that don't want to start their own business. So they make excellent employees. <laughs> excellent employees we want them people yes yes yes. I love those people (laughs) yeah and just because you're good at a service doesn't mean that you're going to be good at running a business like it's very 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 different and I think that's why a lot of people do end up spreading their wings and going on their own but then actually go back to being employed a few years later because business isn't what it's cracked up to be for everyone yeah they'll find it too hard um to wear all the hats uh, all of a sudden that it's like, okay, I'm, I'm a marketer, I'm a cleaner, I'm an, um, I'm a, a secretary, um, I'm a bookkeeper, I'm an accountant mm-hmm. and I'm a lash artist. Um, so that's very, very difficult for someone who's not that way inclined. And yet, like you said, just because you are amazing at something, it doesn't mean you're cut out to be a business owner and you're right that's where it will stay they'll stay at one person or they'll have a crack at having one employee maybe two and it'll just be hard like too hard and usually it implodes and then they end up going back to working for somewhere else or, or work on mm. their own yeah, I've seen it happen so many times yeah it's a shame but it's it is definitely not for everyone it's mm. not yeah it's it's not it's it's the business owner life is a very um, interesting one, <laughs> mm. but I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> Would you not? Do you find it lonely? Like what, what's your struggles of being in business? Yeah, I, I do find it lonely. Um, I feel like a lot of people don't even really understand what I do. Mm. Um, because you're like nodding your head. You're like, yeah, I get that. Um, because my role has changed so much over the years, um, prime example would be this week, you know, where we're in between Christmas and New Year. It's that really strange week where, you know, some people are working, some people are on holidays, some people are laying around doing nothing, just eating and drinking. But I have lost count of how many times I've been asked by family and friends, oh, so how long have you got off work? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't really get time off work. Like, oh, but your salon's closed. I'm like, yeah, but I work like every day. Like I'm creating content. I'm getting back to DMs. I'm on Zoom. Um, I work all the time. And also even forget the coaching and mentoring side of things. You know, this week I'm, I'll be building a new website for my salon. And yes, I do know that's something that I could delegate. I've tried it. I don't like what they give me. I know that I'm the best person for the job and that I'll get it done and I'll be really happy with it. So that's what I'm going to do. But, um, you know, work for me never stops and, and it is very lonely. People don't understand. Mm. Um, I usually get, well, why are you doing that? Take some time off, you know, like, oh, you just work so hard all the time. Like, you know, just spend some time with your family or, you know, come and have a drink at the pub with us or, you know, and it's, it's, it's hard um, because people just don't, they don't get it. And I, I find it hard to talk. This is why I'm so excited to meet you and talk to you because I'm like, yes, like someone, that someone gets who it. gets it. <laughs> so, yeah. Someone who gets it. Um, I, because people, especially around here for me, I find it very hard to converse with people. Um, even, I don't know about you, Katie, but I tend to play myself down a bit in a lot of conversations, you know, um, 
people will be talking about their money struggles or something like that. And I'll be sitting there kind of going, oh, well, you could just start a business and like, you know, make heaps of money. But, um, you know, like I'm not going to say that because they're not looking for my advice, but, um, you know, even shopping and things like that, it's, it's hard. Um, you know, I, I like nice things. I spend a lot of money on nice things. Um, and I can't share that with my friends and a lot of my family Mm. because I feel bad, um, or I feel like I'm showing off. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a lonely life. Um, yeah. And yeah, you, you're sitting there going, yeah, you're, you're nodding and you're going, I totally get get this. (laughs) Yeah. I completely, completely get it. When you said that you, um, like kind of little what you do like a lot yeah. of people just think I have a salon and that's it there's no point yeah. even explaining all the other things it's, I do because they just won't understand it's very difficult it um and usually I I don't know even I, I don't even know what to say when people ask me what I do <laughs> because I'm not a beauty therapist anymore really I'm not a lash tech anymore like I am but I'm not it's not the only thing I do I don't feel like it accurately describes my whole um you know career um but sometimes I'll just go oh I've got a salon yeah and then they and then they go oh yeah okay Mm -hmm. and they just assume that I'm in there working slaving away it's really tough um you know I've I've had my husband's auntie say to me um she goes oh you still got your little salon yeah (laughs) She goes, oh, have you got anyone in there helping you? Like, have you got anyone to help you? I'm like, oh, yeah, I've got like eight girls. Um, <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, people, may, they really don't get it. They don't they don't understand. No, um, they so don't. Yeah. And I think I've come to the realisation that that's okay. People aren't going to get it unless they're the people that are on our level. Yes. And I remember I think it was actually in a therapy session a few years ago I was like I can't I can't tell people what I do I'm a, I was slightly embarrassed of what I do yeah. because I yeah. didn't want the attention um yeah. and I used to just say I was a beauty therapist even though I stopped being a beauty therapist many 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 years ago and I had to come up with a strap line of for when people ask me what I do to give them back oh I'm the director of the KG brand that and then I don't know like some type of strap line and I just rehearsed yeah. that in my head and tried to become comfortable with that line even though it felt so yeah. uncomfortable so when people did ask me I just owned the fact of what I actually done and if they didn't get it they didn't get it they're not my I type of people <laughs> yeah I don't know why it's so hard though like I I totally resonate with this like I yeah, I almost feel embarrassed when mm. I have to say, and I don't yeah. know why. Um, yeah. And yeah, I do. Yeah, I just go, oh yeah, I'm, I've got a salon, and mm. men especially just go, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah my dad has no idea what I do. <laughs> yeah, <same. laughs> he sees me on calls, <laughs> or I'm like, can you look after baby? Why I do this? And he's like, what are you doing? Do you, do you get paid for that? I'm like, yes, I do you get paid for that. <laughs> just don't yeah. understand yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely no idea but yeah no it's it yeah business owner life it, it is it's it's very lonely I feel like that's a big struggle for me uh because people just don't get it they don't understand like you said unless you know you're speaking to someone who does um get it <laughs> which they're few and far between unfortunately yeah for sure what was you doing before business then so before you got into business before lashes what was your world well it's a bit weird um I worked in IT so information technology I when I finished high school oh well, I was always interested in beauty actually um I was that person who did makeup on all their friends, like to go out and, and, you know, we used to do everyone's hair and thought I was a big expert at coloring people's hair and things like that, which I really wasn't looking back. Um, but I really wanted to do beauty. And, uh, at the time, uh, the only college here in my local area, uh, I think the course was about 22,000 
Australian dollars. I'm not sure what that would equate to in pounds, but um, probably probably over 10,000 pounds, maybe mm. 12, 13,000 pounds, I think. Um, but yeah, it was, it wasn't cheap, um, for me, an 18 year old living at home, um, especially when my parents weren't on board with it, like, you know, and we weren't wealthy. Like we, I, my mom was a single mom. Like she struggled. We had nothing. Like there was no, we went from week to week. Um, so she certainly wasn't going to pay for my beauty course. And my dad was so against it. You know, he, he said to me, he was like, you're too smart to be a beautician. And, um, yeah, I, so I didn't do it. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't pay for it. Uh, I didn't do it. So I went to, um, like a TAFE college. Um, it's like a, not, not like university, like, um, I don't know what you would call that in the UK, but, um, yeah, like just a tertiary education type yeah. place and just, and did like a, um, like a diploma in, in IT. Uh, so I worked at my local, local council for a few years. I, lo- I worked at a, um, a wholesaler of, um, Apple computer accessories, which was at the time when the iPod came out, um, and then the iPhone. So it was huge. Um, and I, I did, um, I, I just fell into sales there and, and marketing. Um, and I built his whole website. Um, cause prior to me starting there, he didn't have an online store. Um, and yeah, I did all that. So I, and, and then the warehouse, like, um, you know, ordering, you know, thousands of products and, and, you know, designing packaging and all of that sort of stuff. So that really gave me a good grounding for starting my wholesale business years, like 10 years later. But um, yeah, so I worked in IT, uh, but I still always wanted to do beauty. And anyway, I got together with my boyfriend who is now my husband and, um, he, he's got quite a good job. He's a civil engineer, works in construction, um, and yeah, construction management, project management. But, um, at the time he was like, oh, well, why don't you do the beauty course? Like, if that's really what you want to do. And we felt like we were going to have kids in a couple of years. So we felt that beauty was more of a portable skill. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'd be able to get work anywhere, would be able to do it part-time or casually quite easily. Um, And I thought to myself too, I thought, oh, maybe I could be a beauty therapy um, teacher because it's a hundred bucks an hour. You get paid a (laughs) hundred bucks an hour to teach beauty. Um, And, you know, that was like the Holy grail, but um. Yeah. So I, I, um, I went and did the beauty course and when I was 25, so I was a bit, bit, a little bit older. Um, and I did it and I excelled at it. I absolutely loved it. uh, Only type of schooling or, you know, any sort of study that I did that I just was obsessed. You know, I got a hundred percent in every test. I got highest marks and I, 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 you know, I really prided myself on how well I was doing and, and yeah, and I got a job straight away. I worked in a few different salons. Uh, I worked in, I, I worked in a full service salon. So I was doing, you know, facials, body treatments, um, manis, petties, um, everything. And then, yeah, I went to a different salon that had more of a beauty focus. So less facials, less body treatments, more nails, um, mm-hmm. more waxing, uh, more tans, and they also did this new fandangle thing called eyelash extensions. And this was back in 09. And, um, yeah, I just got trained in salon, shock horror. Um, and we used to do, oh, you know, we only had maybe like two sizes, like a 10 millimeter and like a 14 millimeter mm-hmm. in a 0.25 J curl. Um, but just foul. Like thinking back, I'm just like, Oh, but people loved it. And, um, yeah, I was really good at it. I I actually enjoyed the tediousness, the methodical perfect OCD perfectionist weird. Um, I don't know. And I think I remember this one client, um, she'd been going to this other girl who'd gone on maternity leave and I'd taken over her position And she really didn't trust me. And she was like, oh no, like she was really worried. And anyway, she got up at the end of the service, looked in the mirror and turned around and just hugged me. And this was about my third or fourth set ever, mind you. (laughs) 
but she was like, oh my God, I finally found somebody else that can do it. And yeah, because no one did it back then. It was um, such a hush hush treatment, wasn't it? Yeah, like yeah, it was so yeah. fresh. Yeah. So uh that's where it all started. And then yeah, I got married, had a baby. Uh then I worked from home for a little bit, uh, because it was just easier when I had a baby um who wouldn't have a bottle. And then we moved away. We moved to Sydney in Australia, which is the largest city in Australia. Um, and that was for my husband's work. And I was pregnant with my son. So I had a two-year-old and I was pregnant with my son. I wasn't working. Um, I was being the housewife and I just really realized that that was not what I wanted to do with my life. I, I think I thrive on being busy. I think I thrive on being run off my feet, um, you know, doing different things, having variety, talking to different people. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I told my husband that I wasn't happy, you know, living up in Sydney away from my family and all my friends and being really isolated, not working. And yeah, we moved back home. Um, I was going to go, I was going to rent, um, the space at the back of my hairdresser's salon. Um, but then, you know, after, after a while and after talking to some people and my accountant and things like that, um, he was like, no, just start your own. Like, just, you want to be in your own space. You don't want to have to rely on or adhere to anybody else's trading hours or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I ended up doing a on my own and turns out it was the best thing I ever could have done. So yeah, that's that. so a, a weird you story. <laughs> started your salon with you no, know, you know, being a mum of two young ones, like two under yeah. two, was that? I don't know. You yeah, do that. Yeah. Well oh. I think Isabel Isabel would have been two and a half. No, she would have been three by the time I opened the salon. She'd only just turned three and Patrick was only ten months old when I wow. opened my commercial salon. But prior to that, I was seeing clients at home. So in around, you know, feeding and sleeps mm-hmm. and getting babysitters and waiting for my husband to get home from work so he could watch them while I had clients. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Just it, it's hectic, but I, I love it. <laughs> Definitely. How did you manage then transitioning from being at home to then being in a salon and having babies? Well, I could only afford at the time, um, it was in a completely different financial place to what I am now. Um, I could only afford daycare for two days a week. So when I opened my business, I only worked Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, so my kids were in daycare Thursday and Friday, and my husband um, looked after them on Saturdays because he wasn't working Saturdays. So um those, that's all I could afford. Um, but it's, and I, I made the most of it too. Like I dropped them off really early. I started work at like 8am. I used to work till 10pm. Like my husband used to come pick, pick the kids up from the, um, from the daycare and I would just continue to work. I just wanted to, I really wanted to be successful. I'd taken out a small business loan to start 25,000 AUD, um, which to me back then was, so much money. Um, and I was just determined on paying that back as fast as I could. I had, I needed to prove to everyone that I could do it and that I was legitimate. Um, but yeah, it, it was, I remember just falling asleep, um, you know, on like on a a Saturday afternoon or Saturday night, I get home, I'd, I'd fall, I'd be asleep by six, you know, cause I, I would have done like 30 hours in three days or more. Yeah. Um, just on clients. And, you know, as you know, it's very mentally draining talking to people all day and being on all day mm-hmm. and concentrating, um, which is fine. I, I love it, but it's, it's very exhausting. Um, so I would just fall asleep. I'd be exhausted. Um, you know, I had to be very organized with, um, meals, um, you know, organizing shopping, um, making sure my kids were okay, um, for, you know, when I went to work for those big three days, like organizing everything. Um, so everything would be fine. Um, so that, that was a big, a big struggle. Um, and also to like, just going from home, I think I spoke about this, um, in one of my podcast episodes the other day was I didn't set my prices high enough. 
um, in the beginning because I had all these clients that followed me from home that I was looking after. Um, and yeah, I, I, I didn't. So it's one thing that I would, um, you know, I was desperate to keep these people. I wanted them to follow me. Um, Mm -hmm. but most of those really good clients that did follow me and still, still come to my salon today, you know, they would have supported me no matter what I charged. So, um, it's not about the price. They got a, they got an amazing job. Um, and the experience once I went into the salon was elevated. So, um, yeah, that, that was a big struggle, but I, I put them up and then I had to register for GST quite quickly. Um, so in Australia, um, we have like a goods and services tax, Mm -hmm. um, that everyone has to pay. Um, but you don't have to pay it as a business until you reach $75,000 in revenue. So I think that's the same as our VAT then, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Is it the same amount? Yeah. 85,000. Yeah. Yeah. 85. Yeah. So the threshold in Australia is 75,000. And I remember when I started, I said to my accountant who I didn't really like, um, but I didn't know any better. Um, I thought accountants were all the same and, you know, just old, old, old guys <laughs> that, you know, just crunch don't the like numbers. Taking and, risks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, and don't take women seriously, especially women mm-hmm. in the beauty industry. But, um, I said, oh, do I need to register for my Baz, which is how you pay your GST if you're in business in Australia. And he goes, oh no, we'll just worry about that if you get close to 75,000. And I think I went back, um, I think I went back and I had a meeting with another accountant at the same firm and he said, oh, blah, 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 blah. When we do your BAS. And I said, well, you don't do my BAS because I'm not registered for GST. And mm-hmm. he went, what? You've already, you've already gone over the 75,000. And that was within like four or five months. Um, so yeah, um, it, <laughs> it it was hard because then I had to add that 10% onto my price. Otherwise that was a hit that I took. That was 10% out of my profit margin, mm. which kind of sucked. So I felt like I was apologizing to everyone. Like, I'm oh, really sorry. I've had to put my price up, um, you know, 10%, you know, because my accountant made a mistake, you know, I was trying to justify myself, but everyone was fine. Like not one person left me. So, um, yeah, those were probably my biggest struggles in the in the early days before I had staff. Oh, and the fact that I was just so busy. Like I, I yeah, so I didn't have busy. time. Yeah, 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 so busy wearing all the hats. So yeah, yeah. Would you say that if you could start business all over again from scratch, is it the pricing you would have done differently, or is there anything else you would have done differently? Yeah. So pricing, um, and mind you. I, at the time I was well above anybody else in my town. I was double the price of a full set of everyone else. And I was still booked out six weeks in advance within a month of opening, you know, so don't let high price, like people aren't deterred by it. Um, you Why know, are you, people so fearful, aren't they? Of putting I, their prices I, up. I don't know. I don't uh, like, just do it. Like, you'll yeah I I've got so much to say on this subject but yeah like um definitely the pricing um I should have gone higher and I should have probably gone into a bigger space I should have trusted myself more I really thought that I'd be working on my own for a really long time um I guess that's what I was conditioned to believe that you know beauty small game it's a side hustle this is going to be a complimentary income to your family your husband's the primary earner um so I just I hired this um I leased this um 31 meter square shop like it was tiny um and I outgrew it in 12 months so um I wish that I had have believed in myself a little bit more um so I wish I had have done that and I wish I had have hired sooner um, mm. because I think I left, I left that too long. Um, I got to a place of desperation and good hires never, ever, ever come from a good place, from a place of desperation. Um, so I let myself get to the point where I'd added that extra day in. Um, I started doing the Wednesday because I was making money and I went, oh, I probably can afford an extra day of daycare now. So I'll work Wednesdays as well. 
And um, yeah, I, as soon as I did that, I think three weeks later, um, I was booked out six weeks in advance. Like I didn't even have a 10 minute gap. Wow. Um, it was incredibly difficult. I had no one helping me with the social media. I had no one answering my phone. I had no, like, I, I don't, this, this time in my life really, it was a blur. Um, mm. But yeah, I should have hired a lot sooner than what I did um, because the person that I chose, I chose based on her skills, existing skills, and she wasn't the right person for my business. And she worked for me for about six months and it, it was great. It was, it was fine, but she really didn't have an interest in growing my business the way I did. So my, it was my second hire after that, that I had to spend more time training. Mm -hmm. Um, she was really excited to grow with me and, you know, go into a bigger shop and get more clients and sell more retail and, you know, and hire more staff. Um, so yeah. Um, don't ever let it get to a point of desperation where you are just that booked out and you have no time to train anyone and you have no time to choose someone properly or interview them properly. Um, yeah, that would be my advice. So I should have believed in myself more, went higher on the prices and I should have hired sooner. Mm, definitely. And the emergency hiring is always like a no-go. It just doesn't work, does it? And we've but all we been need- there. We need to learn these lessons the hard way though, don't we? We, unless you've got a coach or a mentor or someone telling you um, the mm-hmm. right way to hire. Um, but yeah, certainly I've learned this lesson probably took me three or four goes before I went, ah, oh, yeah. Hiring based on skills alone is not, not the best idea for my business. Um, it's just really not turning out well. Um, or, you know, rep- like rushing to replace someone as soon mm-hmm. as someone's left. So now I've learned that I always, I like to sort of have one too many staff than what I really need. Um, like a bit of a floater. Um, because if you only have enough staff for what you're currently doing and you're booked out and, you know, you're, you're at, you know, your re- your retention rates up above 80%, um, as a salon, um, if someone's sick, someone goes on holidays, that means you have to go back in, um, or, you know, you lose money, um, because you've got not enough, you've got too much demand with not enough supply. So Mm -hmm. I always like to have someone that is a little bit of a floater maybe, um, to fill in. Um, I don't have that extra person at the moment, unfortunately, I need to get onto that in the new year, but, um, yeah, I've certainly found that, yeah, rushing to replace someone when they quit, especially if you don't have that other extra person waiting in the wings, um, it never works out well. <laughs> yeah, we do exactly the same. We always have someone that's like our, our floater. So some we always yeah. are overstaffed. Um, yes. Not too much that affects profitability, but no, just no, enough no, no. if there's any emergencies. Um or then busy times, or if someone falls pregnant, or if someone yep. leaves, then we know we're always covered. And I've you're always covered. preferred that. Yeah. Especially mm. when you're not in the salon or you've got other businesses that you're running, you can't always dip in and out. It's just always good to just have that as backup. There's nothing yeah. worse, is there, than in the morning getting that call going, oh, I can't come to work. And then you're having to cancel clients. Like, I can't deal with that. <laughs> oh, it's. It's honestly the worst. It is the worst feeling. And I used to, um, this used to happen to me a lot back when I had staff that I hired based on skills alone. A um, <laughs> lot of sick days, a lot of sick days and a lot of asking for time off and things like that. Um, and I used to drop everything and go in there and and do clients. And then I realized I'm like, no, Lauren, like that's teaching them that it's okay Um, or that you're going to do it. You're just going to be waiting and you're going to step in and do their clients for them if they're, you know, Mm -hmm. sick or sick. Um, but, but yeah, so I stopped doing it. I made a lot more difficult, um, for them to call in sick. I, I wrote a procedure, you know, you need to call me at least two hours before you're due to start. Mm -hmm. Text messages will not be accepted. If you can't get a hold of me, you call this person. Um, at least two hours before you're due to start. Um, Text messages will not be accepted. 
Um, you know, and as soon as I made it a lot more difficult for them to call in sick, um, they stopped doing it. <laughs> mm. And, and you'll find I might the- add, oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say a lot of these um, sicknesses, they weren't actually. No, so yeah, hungover. yeah, 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 hungover or just didn't want to go to work, couldn't be bothered. Um, but yeah, I really don't experience this very much anymore. Um, at all, like all of my team, all of my team at the moment, like I've trained most of them from scratch. So, um, you know, they're all very grateful and they're happy to work, happy to be there. It's a really good environment. It's an environment that they want to be in. Um, you know, sometimes I've actually had to send people home. I'm like, mm. hey, I can tell you're not well. How about you go home? I'll do your last few clients of the day and you rest so that hopefully you'll be all right by tomorrow. But if you're not, just let me know. But I knew that they're legitimately sick. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. We're exactly the same. It's like it depends what culture you create within your salon because if you have a lot of sickness, you'll find if one person does it and you're always okay with them doing that, and the t- mm. rest of the team can see that you're just letting that go when they've got a little cough or they've got a sniffle or they just can't be bothered to go to work that morning. It's not so scary to text you to say, I'm not coming in. So you find that yep. there's this repeat process that keeps happening with teams being sick. Whereas when you yep. have that process in place and like you say, it's exactly the same as we say two hours before you have to call, don't text. You think, oh God, I can't do that. I have to come in. It's and then when hard. exactly then when mm. there's no one that has sickness if someone is actually poorly they still feel like they have to come in and then 100%. you send them home I drove yeah. a staff member home the other day because I was like you're poorly you need to go home I'm not letting you drive I'm taking you home and yeah. she really really appreciated it but she's yeah. still coming to work she and still felt bad yep yeah exactly yep. and that's like that's really a testament to the culture in your mm-hmm. business. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a real team culture. Everyone supports each other. We know that, you know, if one person is sick, um, that it kind of does let the whole team down, um, even though they might not be able to help it, but like yeah. if we're going for like a revenue goal or something like that, um, over the month, they know that like someone being sick is really going to affect that goal. Mm. Um, so, you know, we're all in it together and, um, yeah, it, it does. Uh, it's it's seen sort of like as a bad thing if you if you take a day off. Um, I mean, I feel like certainly since like COVID, it's a little bit different. You know, um, I guess there's been a few more sick days, and it's kind of not taken too well by clients if you're mm. visibly unwell at work um because they're paranoid that you've got covid but um yeah. yeah it's definitely um those fake sick days they really don't happen at all in my business anymore thank god <laughs> yeah that's so good so good saves yeah. the stress of the mornings that's for sure yes yes definitely cuz it's not nice when you are like doing the school run And you get a text, oh, yeah, can't make it. It's half an hour before their first client. And I'm just going, oh, and like, you know, especially if you're working in your salon still quite a lot, um, you know, and you've got nowhere to move those clients, it's really, really difficult. And I hate disappointing people. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Especially like, you know, full sets of lashes and things like that. They might have taken a day off. Um, to get it done. They might've taken the afternoon off. They might've been really looking forward to it. It's before a holiday or a big event. And if we can't get them back in, I just hate the feeling of disappointing people. Yeah, definitely. I think we're all naturally people People pleasers. pleasers. Yes, Mm, definitely. (laughs) Yes, we are. (laughs) Something I talk about a lot. (laughs) People pleasing. Oh, it's exhausting, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. But I think it makes it good it makes us good at our jobs, very, very good at our jobs in the way that we take care of our clients and our team, but it's a double-edged sword. Um, it can mean that you let people walk all over you um, in terms of clients. It can be, you know, with your policies and things like that. Um, if they're not showing up to appointments or they're showing up late or, you know, they're bringing kids or, you know, they're moving around or they're answering their phone and you're not, you know, you're not saying anything because you don't want to upset them. Um and then, and then again with your team, you know, if they're calling in sick and you're like, oh, that's okay, you know, um, or 
you know, they're doing other things. They're, um, you know, being messy or they're not um, mm. speaking properly to their clients or they're not doing, um, you know, they're not checking for stickies at the end of a set, um, you know, and if you just let them get away with it because you're too scared to have that uncomfortable conversation um, because you're a people pleaser, um, it can be really, really hard. So it's definitely something I've had to overcome over the years. I still, I still do it. I'm still pretty soft with a lot of stuff, but I've gotten so much harder with, um, with a lot (laughs) just through experience. The years in business definitely make you tougher and you learn to say no for sure. Otherwise, yes. unfortunately, we just get walked over. So we need to yeah. learn to be tough. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, one really good tip that I learned actually in a therapy session as well um, <laughs> was if someone asks you, if someone puts you on the spot and asks you, and this was specific to me for like my team because I I was becoming resentful of my team members, um, you know, four years ago or whatever, um, asking me things and me agreeing to them because I didn't want to upset them um, because I'm a people pleaser. And then I was growing quite resentful of them because I was like, why are they doing this? You know, oh, Lauren, you said yes. You know, like, so yeah, Um, my therapist at the time was like, you say, okay, I'll have a think about it can I get back to you later in the day or can I get back to you tomorrow or I'll send you an email and let you know, or I'll send you a text message or I'll give you a call, um, you know, at, at a certain time, you've got to give them a time frame for when you're going to let them know, mm-hmm. but it just gives you the time and space to properly consider what they're asking and how you feel about it. And then crafting an answer that's that you're okay with like perhaps a compromise. It doesn't always have to be a no, but um, it could be a compromise. Like, um, you know, one example um, in my business a few years back was my receptionist wanted to go to the snow with one, with one of her friends. They'd won a competition to go to the snow. And it was literally the next day. And I was, I knew straight away that I didn't want her to go because I I needed her. I needed her to be at work and I hadn't arranged anything. I wasn't going to be able to go in and do reception. Um, I had other things to do and, you know, it put me in a really uncomfortable position. And I said to her, um, yeah, I'll have a think about it. I'll get, I'm just got to go now, but, um, I've got an appointment to go to or whatever. Cause I, she just got me when I'd come into the salon Mm. and yeah, I've got something to go to. I'll get back to you within the hour. And yeah, I, I, I knew that I wanted to say no. I texted her and I said, look, it's a really short notice. I understand that you won a competition and it's kind of like, you know, your last opportunity to go to the snow before it melts, but really you're rostered on to work tomorrow. You're a full-time employee. I need you in the salon. I can't replace you on such short notice. I hope you can understand why. And it just gave me the time and the space to actually, um, you know, say no, but in a nice way. And she appreciated it as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, so rather than me getting angry at the time, um, or saying yes, and then being angry later because I'd really put my, dug, dug myself a hole. Um, yeah. So that was a really useful tip. And I use that a lot with my team now. Um, just, you know, if anyone puts me on the spot and now it's kind of trained them into not putting me on spot because they know they're not going to get an answer straight away. Mm, I was going to say that because I was very, very, very similar. And I still would say that's one of the things I struggle with now because I'm very available. I've always made myself available to my team. If they need me, they know where I are. If they call me, they know I'm going to answer within a few rings. If they text me, they know I'll text back within 15 minutes. I'm very available to them. And that was actually a mistake. Like I need to make sure I am available but I don't have to be at their beck and call every single second and so when they did spring things on me exactly like you I would agree because I'd hate to say no and then I'd be like oh my god like an hour later or two hours later or the next day I'd be like why did I do that why did I just not wait and let my feelings sink in and then reply or then call back or email back or however that contact's going to be yeah because it makes such a difference Yeah. And it's such a little thing, but it's helped me so much, like Mm. so much. And yeah, I've, 
I used to be quite available as well, but now I'll only text back during business hours. Like if it's something that's not, you know, I, I, I got, I got a text the other day from one of my staff members at 10 o'clock at night and said, Oh, what are we going to do on stories tomorrow? I'm like, I'll talk to you tomorrow when I see you <laughs> about right, this. And then boundaries. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, because I don't want them to think that, you know, texting me for random stuff at 10 o'clock at night is acceptable. You know, yeah. if it's an emergency or something like that, of course. Um, but for non-urgent things, definitely not. I, I just don't write back. I'll set a little reminder in my phone or I'll add it to my notes, my little to-do list um, in my notes on my iPhone. Um, it's it's massive, massive to-do list. And, but anyway, <laughs> I, um, yeah, I just usually do that because yeah, I don't want to train them to think that, yeah, like I'm going to get back to them straight away. Um, especially out in my time, you know, cause mm -hmm. 10 o'clock at night, I'm usually watching Netflix or like online shopping. Like that's my wind down time. That's my brain numbing time. <laughs> yeah. You've been going all so, day. Yeah. You need that break. And this, it is yeah. just creating them boundaries. And you should do that with clients also, especially if you're like mm. new in business or you've just set up your salon and you want every single appointment. And every time a client contacts you, you're at their beck and call or you've just start building a um, team and they're contacting you. Like it's always about creating them boundaries otherwise everyone would just contact you at every hour and you just feel like you're yep. constantly working like that's why there's yep. online booking systems book through there that's why there's yep. start time and end times contact me there you have all day to speak to me why yeah. do you need to talk to me at 10 o'clock at night yeah and I mean this is something with, that I know so many people in this industry struggle with um because they're people pleasers and um which is fine we're, we're all established that we all are um mm -hmm. but you know, getting one of my coaching clients in particular, um, you know, she said to me one day on a coaching call, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm getting messages. Like I, I'm getting messages at 10 o'clock at night. I'm getting messages at six o'clock in the morning with, from clients asking me to call them as soon as I wake up. Um, and I'm like, I'm really sorry, but you've done this. Mm. You have allowed this to happen because you are writing back to them because they can see that you're online, you know, don't have them on socials, um, on your personal socials or all you need to do. And this is what I did back in the day, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, oh, hi Katie. Um, yep. No worries. I'm sure we can organize to, um, reschedule that appointment. Um, uh, but can you please contact the salon phone number, um, during business hours and, my receptionist will do it for you. Whoever, mm -hmm. whoever my receptionist was at the time. I used to even sometimes say, I don't have access to the booking system. I always played like, that card. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have, I don't have access on this phone. I just try and separate, you know, work and my life, my personal life. Um, so I can't see it on my phone. Um, yeah. Like something really friendly, inside business hours, you know, certainly not at 10 o'clock at night, certainly not within a couple of minutes of them sending it to you um, because it trains them just like with your team. It trains them to think that that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you end up working 24 seven. You can't yeah. be away from your phone. I always su suggest as well. Um, it's a common thing. You've probably found it too, Katie. Um, like women that don't have a separate phone for their salon. They mm. use their personal phone for everything. And I'm just going, oh no, like you need to, you need to have, you need to separate that. You need to have a separate yeah. phone for work um, so that you can switch off mm -hmm. because if you never switch off, you'll burn out and your business won't be fun anymore. You won't want to do it. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's a, it's a very, very fast road to yeah. burn out town if you don't stop. Definitely. And we have a business because we want to create a life that we want to live and that we love. So you need to make sure that the business is running that way. Otherwise, yeah. like say, you're going to burn out and you're going to end up hating what you do. And that's not why we started in the first place. 
No, but so many people don't get that. Like they just keep, and look, I've even been guilty of this. Um, I'm a bit of a workaholic. I will keep working, keep working. If I got, you know, it's, you said it before, your business is your hobby. My business is definitely my hobby. I don't have any other hobbies. Um, but <laughs> you know, I, I just, I feel like people get so caught up in just making money, seeing as many clients as they can, not letting people down and they end up inadvertently creating this life that they don't want because mm. they're, and, and they, they can't grow a team. They're reluctant to grow a team. They can't step back, um, you know, and they're just working 24 seven. Yeah. They might be making money, but they've got no time to spend it. They've got mm. no time to enjoy holidays or anything like that with their family and friends. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a vicious cycle, isn't it? That I call it the hamster wheel of lashing. It's very mm. hard to get off it once you're, um, well and truly on there. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And on yeah. the subject of money, you've created a seven figure lash business, not six yeah. figures, but seven figures. What's Crazy. the secret? There is not a secret. Um, <laughs> I was able to do that within four years of opening. You know, I think my first year, I think I, I had total revenue of like 126 K then it was nearly 300. Then, then 500 then 800 then you know like it just it 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 just kept doubling and uh, there there is no secret you have to work hard um I worked very very hard for a long time I put everything um all of my being into having um an amazing salon and the money but I enjoyed it I I I I love it um Mm. maybe that's the secret actually um you know, just wanting to help people and wanting to be good at what you do and wanting to, um, you know, grow a team and sustain their financial, um, you know, free, you're empowering them with, with, um, their own, um, financial success as well. You know, all of my team, they're on, um, bonuses and incentives. Um, so they, they earn a lot of money too. My team paid very, very well for what they do. Um, you know, and they have good hours. I'm very, um, you know, aware of, um, you know, the work-life balance for them. I don't want them to burn out. Mm. Um, but I think, yeah, just being happy what you're doing, truly loving what you're doing. I love my clients. Um, I love having a salon. I love the social aspect of it with my team and clients and the money just followed. Mm. Um, you always I, find that it's not actually the money. That's the passion. It's always no. the business. that's the passion and the money just comes. I thought in the beginning it was the money mm-hmm. when I first started, I was like, no, I, you know, I want to make more money than what I would working for somebody else mm-hmm. with more flexibility. But I, I ended up on that hamster wheel I was just talking about, um, you know, two years in and doing 50 hours of clients um, and not being able to get myself out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it took, someone leaving me realizing that my business was worth nothing without me. And that's when I started putting things in place, um, you know, policies and procedures, adding more team members, teaching them everything I knew, only marketing them on socials. I stopped marketing myself, um, putting all those things in place to create a really valuable asset. Um, and in turn, it's really funny and you, you're a testament to this as well, but The less I work in my business, the more money I made. It's crazy, isn't it? Everyone's so fearful of hiring because all that money is then going to go on wages and they can't understand that whole concept. But you you earn so much more money when you're not behind the chair and you have teams doing it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've I've encountered a lot of... um, You know, I've had friends and things. I was mentioning earlier, it's very hard to talk to people you know, about what I do and things like that. Um, I remember having a conversation, I think it was only maybe 12 months ago with um, not really a friend, more of an acquaintance, a friend of a friend. And, you know, she was talking about her massage therapist um, and 
how she created this allied health space where, you know, she had all these different contractors renting space from her because usually, um, you know, the owner of a business like that just works all their staff into the, into the ground and then collects all the money at the end of the day. And I'm sitting there going, oh, this is awkward. Um, and she looked at me and she said, well, how much do you pay your staff, Lauren? And I told her, and it's above award wage plus bonuses. They always get their bonuses as well. And she's like, so in Australia, like, you know, it's about $30 an hour in beauty. Um, plus my highest bonus is an extra $7 an hour for every hour they work. So 37, around $37, $40 per hour, mm. which is quite high. Um, for the beauty industry, um, I'm not sure what it's like in the UK. Obviously our dollar is very different, um, yeah. but you know, it's, it's quite high. And, um, you know, she looked at me and she goes, oh, that's not very much. And I'm like, well, you know, they don't have any stress. They don't have, um, they don't have to market themselves. They don't have to get clients. They just show up to work show and up. do the work, you know, like, so, um, yeah, you know, but. I, I do pay my staff well, but in turn, they make me a lot of money. Mm. Um, so it's, it comes back to you. And, it, you know, if, if you're um, motivating and incentivizing your team well enough, um, you know, they should be more than tripling their wage for you. Um, and that's where a lot of people get stuck too, like business owners with their staff. Yeah. Like you just said, they're just thinking about the cost. Um, oh, it's going to cost me this and they're only half booked or whatever. Um, you know, so they're not actually bringing in sufficient amounts of revenue, Mm -hmm. um, to make you a really good profit margin. Um, so yeah, like you've got, it's all, it's all well and good to hire staff, but you've got to be able to manage that team effectively, keep them happy, keep them making money for you, um, and keep them motivated, keep them you know, interested. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. And I like to look after them so that they don't want to leave, you know, so that they, they want to stay. It's easier for them to just keep earning good money in my salon rather than going and starting their own. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I definitely agree with that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say is the best ways to scale a business? So you've gone in there, obviously on your own, absolutely grinding, you've slowly built a team. Like how, how would you say is the best way to scale a business? Definitely a team. Um, I mean, if you're talking salon business, um, a team, you need to delegate. You need to be able to delegate things to your team. Uh, see, be able to recognize qualities in them um, outside of just lashing or beauty. Um, you know, I've got one team member that does, uh, all my ordering for my salon. You know, it's something that I used to do and, Mm. you know, I used to leave it to the last minute and we used to run out of things and, you know, just because I was just trying to do everything and it never works. Um, so created a system around ordering. She does that. Uh, Another team member was doing, she was responsible for all my training. Like she was training all the team. Um, I would only step in occasionally. Um, yeah. Policies and procedures. Writing those, yes, it's a time-consuming job when you do it, but it's going to save you hours and hours and hours of time over the life of your business because you can induct someone, a new staff member, in like a quarter of the time and you don't physically need to be there. Um, the first, the, you know, the first procedure guide that I wrote was for my administration, um, person. So my, my, my receptionist, um, because I hated having to sit there for like two or three days teaching them all about the booking system or how we answer the phone. I just, I literally just documented it all and how I wanted it done. And then we've got a reference point. Um, and then I just add to it over the years. I believe that a policy and procedure guide is an ever evolving document. Um, because we, you know, things are done differently. Um, software changes, apps change, um, you know, we find better and more efficient ways of doing things. Um, so we can always update and change it. Um, but yeah, definitely staff 
policies and procedures, um, taking myself away from clients. Um, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there six hours a week as opposed to 50 in 2017, I was there 50 hours a week. Mm. Um, you know, and we were doing, you know, 40 or 50 K months and now we're up over 80. So, you know, like very different because I've actually put time into creating all those systems and policies and managing my team, making them happy, um, you know, connecting with them, spending time with them personally, training them, um, incentivizing them as well. Um, communication is a massive thing. And all, all I wouldn't have time to do any of this if I was still working on clients like three, four days a week. Um, and you don't have the headspace to be able to do it either. No. Cause you just, you're in the trenches. You're, you can't see what's happening. You can't be objective about your business. You can't see future growth. Um, when you are just bogged down with clients. Um, mm. so yeah, like definitely also to the last thing, like go with your gut <laughs> as well. Um, there's been times where I've needed like one staff member, like to grow, um, you know, like. I was like, okay, we're at 80% capacity. You know, we're pretty booked. Um, everything's going well. We're coming into like summer. So it, it's naturally busier. Um, you know, I'm growing. I want to grow more. That's my goal. I need a new team member. Okay, I'll start advertising. And then I'm interviewing and I like two. And I'm like, I really like both of these girls. Can I hire two of them? Yep. I'm just going to make it work. I'm just, I love the saying bite off more than you can chew and then chew really freaking hard. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah. So, and those have been gut instincts. Even when I got a full-time receptionist, like my first full-time receptionist, I was like, can I afford this? And I was ringing my accountant and a different accountant at this stage. (laughs) Um, but I was ringing my accountant going, can I afford this? You know, I'm so worried, blah, 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 blah. And she said to me, she goes, look, if anyone can do this, Lauren, you can, um, I've got faith in you. You can easily cover her wage and it's not going to really affect profitability. Um, a lot of people in this industry can't see the value in hiring a receptionist. They try and teach them beauty as well. So they can cover their wage. Um, but I hear that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like I'll hear someone go, Oh, I I taught them how to do teeth whitening so that they can cover their wage. I'm like, no, they just need to focus on their job and that's customer service and optimizing your bookings. Um, you know, the week of Christmas last week, my receptionist, Sarah is amazing. She's a gun. Um, you know, we have a waiting list. I don't, I think there was like a hundred people on it. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. It's insane. I'm understaffed at the moment, but like, yeah. Anyway, people cancelled, she filled it. Someone cancelled, she filled it. Someone didn't show up. She rang someone because she knew that they were walking around and and wanted to get in. And she thought of them straight away, rang them up, got them in. We were fully booked. We didn't have a spare five minutes. Mm. You know, we had um, historically one of the best weeks we've ever had last week. So, you know, it, they're definitely worth it. Like if you can comfortably, like, I'm not saying put, put a receptionist on or an administration assistant or something like that. Um, you know, if it's going to put you under financial pressure, but if you can work it, I would definitely say that's a really great step in the growth of your business because you do need someone who's focused on customer service and bookings. Mm. If they're trained well, and they're the right person for that job role, then it's only going to improve the business and bring more profit in anyways. 100%. It's it's just literally making that step and really knowing what their job description is and exactly what you want them to do rather than just thinking, oh, it's just answering the door. It's just answering the phone. It's not. It's so much more than that. It's not. And you can give them so much other work as well Mm. outside of that. Um, But, yeah, like... I, I don't think I would ever go without a full-time receptionist ever again. (laughs) Mm. How did you find that transition personally 
stepping out of the salon and having like all that time with your clients all the time with the team and then all of a sudden you're doing six hours a week well it was a gradual process um so I didn't just you know stop um I think early on um because I was very wary of doing it um I didn't believe that I could wholeheartedly um and I'm a control freak as well I like to have a handle on everything. I like to be there, know know what's going on, know all the clients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think I, you know, I cut back by half a day, you know, and then a couple of months later, it was another half a day. And then the following year, it was one full day. And then six months later, it was another full day. Um, so it was a grad, a gradual process for me, um, I'm not saying that that's how you have to do it. You can certainly just cut them. Um, I've got a coaching client from Canada that um, she went and got married and came back from her honeymoon and went, I don't want to work in my salon anymore. (laughs) And she just didn't. She just never went back. I mean, she's still very much present and she's doing, you know, what I do and what you do, Katie. Um, You know, she's managing her team. She's incentivizing them, keeping them motivated, doing all the socials. She's actually training um, students in lashes as well. Um, And I'm pretty sure she has a product line too, but, um, you know, she's certainly not bored. Um, But yeah, she she did just cut it. Um, But yeah, like that, the transition, it, it was easier than what I thought. Um, Also too, because my clients had time to get used to it. Um, Mm. It was okay. My team had time to get used to it as well. Um, So it wasn't as if, yeah, I just stepped out. Um, It was over. I think I started cutting my hours down 2018, late 2018, I think. So over the last sort of three years we had COVID in there as well so Mm. obviously wasn't at work then but um yeah but I still try and be very present um I've just done major renovations in my salon I've got an office space now in there which is really great so I can just even if I'm I'm doing um stuff on my other business um I can I can go in there and just work and just be present Mm -hmm. help out if need be um yeah so the transition wasn't too bad. And I really felt, um, that, yeah, I, I felt a lot more mental clarity as well. Um, like I mentioned earlier, when you are just doing clients all the time and you're in the thick of it, um, it's really, really hard to be objective about situations that arise in the business and see, Mm. see where you want to go in the future. Yeah, definitely. And then lastly, when it comes to marketing, because obviously you've got such a successful salon, there must be some type of marketing that happens within there. Do you find most of your time is socials or is there another way of marketing that you do? No, it's it's socials. Um, although I've been pretty I've been pretty lax with my salon socials the last few months just because I am understaffed. Um, I don't know if this is happening in the UK at the moment, but there's just a real mm-hmm staff shortage across all industries it's not just beauty exactly Um, the same okay yeah um so I um I had a long-term staff member leave in um June uh for a complete career change she went into social work and um she'd worked for me for six years and so it was a big loss um I miss her so much I I have dreams that she's like no I I don't like social work anymore I'm going to come back but um so she left and then I lost another one in um in September it just didn't work out but um so I've been advertising since September and I cannot get anyone so um I was looking for someone with qualifications though um because leading into Christmas I didn't have Mm. huge amount of time to train someone. Um, but yeah, as of next week, new year, um, I will be, um, advertising, I think probably for two, two trainees. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I've been understaffed and, and yeah, like I know that I can't keep up with the demand. Um, so I, really, we've only been posting a couple of reels a week. Um, you know, like I used to be like an everyday person, like Mm. every day we post, um, we're on stories every day. Um, I've delegated that, um, to my team. Um, we're on stories every day. So, 
you know, at least even if we haven't posted for a day or two, like the lights are still on, you know, yeah. like, cause I reckon when you see someone's profile on Instagram and there's no stories, it's like, yeah, the lights are on, but no, no one's home, mm-hmm. you know, um, when you don't see that there's fresh stories there. So I really like to focus on stories, um, and, and just keep that engagement rate up. Um, but yeah, I, I've been a little bit lax with my salon socials, but I have tried other methods. Um, I've done cinema advertising, um, done radio advertising, I changed all of my um, client intake forms to ask where Mm. they have heard about us and not one person said the radio, not one person said the cinema when I was doing those advertising campaigns. Um, It's word of mouth and Instagram. Wow. So that is where I put my efforts. Uh, We have like a referral system in my salon. Um, So yeah, if, if we have little referral cards, um, and if like we give them to our clients and, you know, if they get compliments on their lashes or brows, they're like, Hey, this is where I get my lashes done. You get $20 off if you go there and you use this and then they get $20 off too. So they're incentivized to spread the word about yeah. us. Um, so word of mouth is very, very, very powerful. And especially on socials as well, I just want to say like, I feel like a lot of people in, in hair and beauty get it wrong. Um, they forget who their audience is. Um, if you have a bricks and mortar salon, you really need to market to the people in your local area. Uh, mm. You know, you shouldn't be creating content that is going to impress other lash artists on the other side of the world. or you, They're never going to be your client. They're um, not going to so, know or care what no. lengths you're using or what diameter no. you're using. Or... No, no. <laughs> no. So stop with the technical descriptions in your caption. No one cares. Your clients don't understand. Some might, but most of them don't. They mm-hmm. just care how it looks. What's it going to do for them? What's in it for them? How is this service going to benefit them? That's what you need to be answering in your content for your salon. Um, and that sometimes it's hard. Like, um, you know, content blocks are real. Um, sometimes you just don't feel like showing up. And I guess it's that discipline and the years of just doing it and being in, in a routine with it that helps. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, certainly for my business, um, Instagram, Facebook initially, um, I feel like Facebook is not what, what, what it used to be anymore. Um, I don't have a TikTok. I'm like, Oh, it's another thing. Oh, I know. It's another Um, extra. (laughs) <laughs> I know, but I feel like I'm going to have to jump on that bandwagon soon. Um, but yeah, for social media is definitely, and, and word of mouth. We, we, we pride ourselves on, um, you know, a, a really high level of customer service and a really fantastic result. Um, so obviously people in the local area talk about it. My salon is right in the CBD. Uh, so people walk past, I have signage up, um, you know, they can see my salon, they can see that it looks beautiful as well. Um, you know, I've invested a lot of money um, just this year into a, a massive refit. I've nearly every year up until last year, I think I've renovated some part of the salon. I like to keep it fresh. I like to keep it interesting. Um, people walking past, they can see and they go, oh, that's beautiful. You know, I want to go there because it looks so nice. Mm. Um, yeah. So definitely word of mouth and and social media there's yeah I've never done newspaper no one reads a newspaper no one reads magazines anymore um radio no tv certainly wouldn't do tv um I don't even think people watch free-to-air tv anymore with ads like they're just watching streaming services where they're not going to see ads you know from a local business so yeah, that's that's where it's at for me and where it's always has been. I've always put a, a a big focus into social media. So on the subject of socials, whereabouts can people connect with you? Oh, yes. Okay. So on Instagram, uh, my handle is Lauren Lappin underscore. So L-A-U-R-E-N-L-A-P-P-I-N underscore. And if you want to check out my salon and not judge me for the lack of um posts that I've been putting up lately (laughs) my salon is Alua Lash and Beauty Bar so I think it's Alua so A-L-L-U-R-E underscore Lash Beauty Bar Um, and yeah websites as well so laurenlappin.com.au and alualashes.com.au 
that's where you can find me we will pop all of them links in the show notes so everyone can just click on there and check you out if you've loved this episode as much as me please tag this episode share it on socials and tag me and lauren in there and oh, i'm gonna let you go because we could talk for We've literally been talking, hours I know. <laughs> You're like you're like my new business bestie, I feel. <laughs> we might have to do like a whole series of podcasts. <laughs> I know. Or I'm just gonna have to come visit you or something. Like I have I mean it's a great UK. excuse it's to come to the UK. Excellent. I actually can't think of a better excuse, really. <laughs> 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 oh it's been an absolute oh. pleasure having you on so thank you so oh. so much no thank you so much I I'm so happy to be here and we've had such a great chat um really great questions and it's yeah so great to meet you and yeah be on here so thank you you're welcome